You are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair on RLM Radio. The girl of your dreams has got to be in some bar. Sorry, boys and girls, but this is X-rated. So if you're under 18... Get out, get out, Get the point. Good. And now... Fendo. Y'all ready for this? We do it all night long. And now, your host, Grammy. Hi, hey, I actually get to be on the radio tonight. Whee! (laughs) Hey there, hi there, ho there, everybody. You are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair here on RealLibertyMedia.com, Channel 10, and on Channel 3. You know, that's a generic one, but I got my own channel now, so I gotta say the Channel 10. We're also on the Real Liberty Media, the RLM Spreaker Channel, and RLMRadio.xyz, and RLM TuneIn Radio Station, and RLM Internet Radio Station, and I just realized I said we, and what the hell, I don't even have pockets. Oh yeah, I do, in my shirt. Never mind, I was thinking about the mouse I had in my pocket that, you know, whee! Oh no, that's a little pig. Little pig, little pig, let me in. <laughs> Oh, damn, Dan, Dan, Danny C. got to see Buffett do that song four times. Man, I don't know where I'm going to go when the volcano blows. Oh, and the more time. No, we won't do that to you again. Oh, well, yeah, I have been on vacay and computer issues and grandbabying and all kinds of other crazy stuff <laughs> last week and a half, and it's like, Holy cripes, and then wind and storms, and yeah, this evening I had electricity go off on me four times. It's like, whoa, this sucks. I finally decided that I was going to just connect my iPad to uh, my phone, and then that way, if the internet went to shit again, (laughs) I would at least be able to talk to the guys in the chat and say, hey, I'm still here. The wind's blowing 90 to nothing, which it has stopped doing that now. But, um, yeah, it was odd. You know me, I'm I'm one of them there crazy redneck women from out there in the middle of the boonies. And I went outside <laughs> to see what the hell is going on. Because I looked out the door and I went, shit, that looks wicked. So I went outside. Because, <laughs> yeah, that's how I roll. I'm, I'm, yeah. You know, I'm one of them there people, although I do have more than three teeth. Um, I would stand out there and go, you know, I've seen the Dernator. She's right over there. But, um, yeah, I didn't see no Dernators. But, man, the dirt was blowing in the field just south of me. And it was like, what the hey? It's raining here. Why is there dirt blowing there? <laughs> I didn't go outside the fence. I stayed inside my fence. I was a good little puppy. Or at least my doggies think I'm a puppy. In any case... I got to say, hey, because, you know, I, I just finally got my computer turned back on again because off, on, off, on. That's really hard on electrical appliances, you know. In any case, I got to start saying hey to people just just because I got to sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. I don't know what you boys are talking about over there, but hey, it's cool. Yeah, Grammy's Rocket Chair is live right now on Real Liberty Media. I am going to be rather impertinent tonight. I'm also going to be rather quizzical, I think. Is that a word? I think it is. If it isn't, I just made it up. Because you know what? That's what words do. They cast spells. You can make up words, and if you spell them properly, you can control the narrative. That's some of the shit I'm going to talk about tonight, just because it's been running in my brain for a while, and it's like, wow, they have really messed with us, haven't they? Whoever they are. In any case, over here on Twitter, I got some more stalkers, and then I lost some more stalkers, but that's okay. That's okay, because, you know, that just means I turned a corner a little bit too fast for them. But, uh, hi, Jabberwocky, I see you over here on Twitter, and thank you ever so much, Barman, for tweeting me out. I truly do appreciate it. Okay, over here, I even logged back into Gab.ai, and it's, yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. I kind of troll over there, you know, or maybe you want to call me a lurker. 
that's that's pretty much what I do. I scroll a lot and contribute little. But that's okay. I'm at least over there scrolling. Kind of like what I do over here on this FM site, that Freedoms Network, which if you could find it in your heart and in your pocket to donate to Freedoms Network, that would be truly awesome because the server fees are due August 23rd. That's not too far away. Today is 8 8 2018. Ooh, lots of eights in there. Numerologists are going absolutely nuts. Hello, rascal. I know you love mommy, but your claws hurt, sweetheart. Okay, uh, so over here on this effing site, let me refit. Thank you, Grimner, for letting everybody know that I'm up and going over here. You, you the bomb, Grimmy. That's just all there is to it. You're like a big old kaboom. You lower the kaboom on people when they need it to. And the lovely Miss Kate has a tendency to uh, see Grimmy lowers a kaboom and because he is the RLM God with a G-A-W-D. But Miss Kate has that ever so special boot <laughs> and she boots bots right and left. It's like, this is cool. I need to get popcorn and pizza and beer just to watch Miss Kate boot bots. <laughs> boot bot, boot bot, boot bot. Say that three times fast, that, that, that. Okay, so thank you, Grim, over here on this effing site so awesome over here on mines yeah haven't been on there for a couple hours because well i was playing out in the yard until i got tired and my hands got sore from pulling weeds but damn uninvited guests and so yeah i didn't share it over here on mines either but i'm sure the rlm site did so hi everybody over here on mines you know one thing that i have noticed over here is a lot of people post and there's very little interacting that's kind of sort of like this whole social media shit have you ever noticed that a lot of people are so focused on what they're posting that they don't pay attention to anything else that anybody else puts out there therefore it's really rather difficult to find a conversation and then when you do, a lot of times you don't want to get involved in that conversation because it's like, really? You said that? Holy crap. Okay. Yes, I see the flashing going on. <coughs> hey, Rascal Moosey says hi. Moosey says hi. Rascal's just purring. I don't think you can hear it. Um, yeah, I'm a lurking troll. <laughs> or that's better than a troll and lurk, I guess the hell's a troll and lurk i don't know we'll figure that one out too because all you gotta do sometimes is just turn words around and and then you can find out what the real shit's going down or maybe it just kind of fits in with your little psycho tinfoil hat thing it works for me so over on mines yeah i do mm, wow lots of uh korean or not maybe not korean vietnamese um oriental would that be a good way of putting that or asian hmm lots of posts over here that i don't understand because i don't read that language but it's still it's pretty cool to see all kind of people from all kind of places all over the world opening up their minds and maybe not necessarily talking with each other but they're at least sharing a little peek so hey that's cool Okay, over here on Fakie Book. I didn't say nothing over here on Fakie Book either because I'm a slacker. That's just how it is. Darwin! I see you, Darwin. Long time no see. You know what? I even saw Daryl on Fakie Book last week for my birthday. He sent me a birthday wish, which, by the way, thank you, everyone, for the birthday wishes. I had a grand time with the grandbabies. So, um, and I learned a lot. I learned a lot, and there were some things that sort of irritated me, but, you know, after talking with my grandkids, I think it's, I think it's good. I think it's good. I had to have a little chit-chat with my youngest grandson and let him know that just because teachers have gone to school longer than you doesn't mean that they know what they're talking about, hun. And his mom wasn't real keen on me saying that, but, you know, Kids need to understand that, that sometimes teachers can be wrong as well. So, um, what is this? Truth or UFO? When your post piss off the government, McDonald's, the entire meat is industry, the pharma industry, and the black helicopters keep flying. Eee! <laughs> I like that. I like that. I got to put this over here in the chat. 
because that's just that's funny that's yeah Asians don't like to be called Oriental oh they aren't a rug thank you Grim thank you well people from the Far East although why do they call it Far East when actually from where I'm at it's closer to say the Far West but mm, whatever <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. I have been out in the weeds, the uninvited guests, you know, those noxious ones that are not cool, like bindweed and pigweed and that kind of stuff. And they're all going to seed. And I've been out pulling for the last few days. And yeah, whoo, my eyes get gucky. I get to cough and I get to sneezing and wheezing. It's just a fun time of year. But my garden's doing good. So, okay. Now, to say hey over here in the RLM, which is where you need to be, by the way, if you want to give me static. I know you might be listening in on the Spreaker channel, and I know you have the chat option, but I don't have the internet bandwidth to be able to play on that many places. So, come on over to reallibertymedia.com. Think of a nickname. Join the chat. Say hey to everybody. They'll say hey back to you. Give me some shit. They'll get, they'll jump in because, you know, we like to play monkey pile sometimes over here. And then again, there's times where we go, hey, 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 out of line, out of line. It happens too from time to time. But thank you, Vinny. You're such a sweetheart. In any case, over here in the RLM, right up top, I see Barman, the most splendiferous bot in the whole wide world, closely followed by that young man that is always hearing pleasant voices. And I got to figure out who in the hell his ear doctor is, because I want to hear some pleasant voices too. Hi, Cowboy Tech. I also see Grimner, the RLM god, don't you know, as well as the lovely Moose Girl, who was jumping in, giving shit, telling people what for, how come, and then some. Booyah, you go, girlfriend. You know what? You are The way you measure your wealth is the friends that you have. Money don't mean shit. But if you have friends... You are the richest person in the world. And booyah, girlfriend. Booyah. I, I missed the whole convo that you were referencing. But, you know, standing up for a friend. Of course, Moose is just awesome anyway. But, you know, you go, girlfriend. I also see the lovely Kate, who has the mighty boot. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's going to be way cool to sit back and because that happens a lot of times in the mornings you know when I'm sipping my first cup of coffee and I load up the computer and I kind of go Kate's booting again this is kind of cool man look at that Whew, that one went clean across this chat room but okay in my mind it did I also see Asmo's here hi Asmo as well as the lovely Beth Z Chalsa Denis is here God Oh, you guys gotten in there? Oh, my God. <laughs> that's where they got gaudy from, you know? That's so gaudy. That means that's very angelic. Just ask me, I tell you. I can, if I make the word up, I can make up the uh, definition. That's how it works. So, yes. Oh, awesome, Rob. Cool beans. Okay, let's see. Where is it? Chalsa Denis. Soikles! I see my lovely friend Soikles from over in Denmark is still logged in, although she's probably sleeping, which, yeah, that would be a smart move, sweetheart. I also see Chloe E. e is here as well as Colfax 101 is logged in, but marked away. Cyborg Noodle. Such a noodly bot. Ah, the pot for those pastafarians in the chat that's what cyborg noodle is so um may you be touched with his noodly goodness yes all you pastafarians out there from the flying spaghetti monster or church of the flying spaghetti monster in any case that's where Cyborg Noodle comes from. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. I also see Chloe is here, as well as Dakota and Dan Tenny C. Yay! Your friends turn into goons? Whoa. Goonie? Goonie Goons? I've seen that movie, Goonie. I love that. Rocky Road. Uh, I love that movie. In any case, <laughs> I'm 
I'm all over there. Hi, Frumpy. How you doing? I am not scared of lightning. I have a healthy respect for lightning. I had it when I was, I don't know if I ever told you guys or not, when I was, oh, probably seven, eight years old, something like that, helping my brothers with newspaper route, and I was coming home, and the storm was moving in, and lightning struck about five feet in front of me and threw me backwards and knocked my ass out, and yeah, yeah, when I woke up, there was my brother's face right over my face. It was almost a Marcus Welby MD moment. Not quite, because at least I knew that face, but it still freaked me out. Yeah, <clears throat> that was a that was a very strange experience. Yeah, hair on my arm stood up for a week. But um, in any case, yeah, I have a healthy respect for lightning, Frumpy. I'm not afraid of it. I just respect it because it's got a lot more zippity doo dah than I do. Okay, I also see Goober. Oh, did Goober? Goober just fell out. Damn it, Goob. I was just getting ready to say hey to you, and you fell out. Well, Gooberzilla was here, but then he quit. And I'm here. Hi, me. I also see I.B. Don C. as well as I.B. Don C. Java, 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 Java Doctor 2 is in the house. And looky there, J.J.'s, that Scottish feller, who I still try to picture with a kilt, but all I can see is a kilt and furry legs because I don't know what J.J.'s looks like. Mm. <laughs> Hi, Juana Taco. Had tacos last night. And you know what? Um, Yeah, I still have enough taco meat that that's what's going to be for supper tonight, too. Booyah, bonus round. Um, Let's see. Kozu is in the house. Hey, Kozu, you know what? I found out that my kazoo went to the grandkids. <laughs> I have a recorder, though, but it's not the same as a kazoo. Uh, yeah, Rob works. I did get a charge out of it. It was a rather shocking experience. <laughs> yeah, and yes, it did add blue streaks to my hair, too. And it left a pretty good-sized hole in the ground, too. It's like, whoa, that could have been me. Yeah. <clears throat> in any case, Meister Brower, hey Woody, how you doing, hon? Moy, 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 moy is here, as well as Peace Guy. Hi, Peace Guy, how are you, hon? Pox, oh, we got lots of poxes going on. Uh, what about Frumpy? I don't know, what about Frumpy? <laughs> Let's see. So, how many poxes do we got? We got a lot of poxes. A pox, lots of poxes going on in the chat. We got pox box, poxified, poxophone, poxy home. And we also have a pompa pop a pawn sauce, as well as a lovely rain, which I had some of that outside just a little bit ago, but it came down at an angle. So, I'm sure my rain gauge didn't catch much of it. I also see RLM Fluke, the Vanna White of the RLM channel. How you doing? Uh, Rob Works is here, and I've seen him fire up that bubbler. I even seen him fire up that bubbler when I was on my iPad trying to check with y'all. Um, oh, what about Frumpy? Oh, I'm dressed Frumpy. Oh, <laughs> I am too. In any case, see, that's why I don't do video, because, yeah, y'all don't need that. <laughs> Sock Puppet! Hi, Sock. How are you doing, hon? Skittle, the f bominator. Booyah. Don't click continue reading at the bottom. Really? Oh. Hmm. Okay, I won't, Grim. I just won't click on that at all because, yeah, it's in California. Are you really shocked? In any case, it's a link Grimmy shared in the chat. For those of you that aren't in the chat and really should be over in the RLM chat just to say hey. Uh, let's see. Skittle, yeah, the abominator. Trust no one, that trusty fella girl, although I actually do kind of sort of like it when he's Darth Rooms because that's then I get to do the voice. Vinny! Vinny! <laughs> Okay, and looky there, Phantom, to round up the crew, the one, the only, the Phantom of the chat, who did my intro for me, by the way. I know I've told you guys that before, but yeah, mm-hmm, 
he's pretty awesome okay so should I tell you about how I spent my time with my grandkids I had so much fun that uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Grimmy, I did too. And you know why? Because, you know, I said, take off my dress and take off my slip and take off my bra and take off my panties and take off my nylons and I don't want to catch you wearing my clothes ever again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's going to get me all kinds of nasty remarks, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, Vinny is rounded out on the... Oh, well, there you go. Okay. Um, because to buy that much hash power... Oh, oh wow. Okay. Whatever. In any case, my time with my grandkids, which I did have a grand time. I had a wonderful birthday. My daughter got me some new flip-flops because I absolutely... I live in flip-flops. I'm either barefoot or flip-flops in the summertime. And these are made from uh, recycled rubber and recycled yoga pants. And they're just the most comfortable things in the whole wide world. And she got them off of Amazon. And they're just, they really are. They're very gushy and squishy and very soft and, and stretchy. And, and yet your feet don't slide out of them. And they are, they're very comfy. So I'll have to find the link on Amazon and share it. But in any case... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I finally made it to you guys. Okay. Um, <laughs> in any case, I got the flippy flops for my birthday, and then we went to an 80s concert, and I was so impressed with this group, and it's really, really easy to remember their name because their name is the 80s group. And they covered everything from salt and pepper to ACDC to Guns N' Roses to Def Leppard to Van Halen to, I mean, they covered just about everything, even the bangles. They even did, they had four people that sang lead and they were amazing. And you know, the only break, the only break, and I mean to tell you, they went from one song right into the next. There wasn't any like break. It was just this song kind of toned down and then the next song started up. But they did have one time there where they did the little announcements to thank the, uh, the uh, um, Parks and Recreation Committee because it was a free concert. Um, they have vendors there that, you know, sell food and beverages and all that fun stuff. And the library actually had a beer garden. And you don't buy beer, you make donations to the library. And depending on how much of a donation you make, that's how many tickets you get for beer. So it really was very cool. And the uh, Parks and Recreation Committee, they pay for these bands every Thursday to come in and put on a two-hour performance. And these people were awesome. They had two gals and three guys. And the one guy that was the lead singer, they started out with um, Let's Go Crazy by Prince. And the lead singer, or actually this the guy lead singer, actually did kind of look like Prince. It was kind of cool. But, and then they just went off from there. So amazing, amazing concert. Had a great time. And, um, oh, my goodness, that was Gab. <laughs> that was fun. I totally forgot to, yeah, turn off the sound on my, uh, yeah, my browser. Oops. That is kind of cool, though. I like the gab thing where it, where it does the ribbit, ribbit. <laughs> okay. Everybody apparently likes it when I said egad over a picture of shitlery. Mm, well, you know, that, that would scare hell out of me if I saw that. Mm, I would definitely say something more than egad. In any case... So, my daughter still had to work Friday, so I was home with the grandkids. <laughs> home alone with the grandkids. Oh, yes, this should make you fearful. My grandkids had a great time. Uh, in any case, my youngest grandson was not doing well with vocab last year. 
And so his mom got him a vocabulary book, and uh, he had to do three pages front and back every day throughout the summer to get to where he was, you know, up to speed because he, yeah, he's not doing good, not doing good. And um, while I was helping him with his vocabulary stuff, relearning about homonyms and synonyms and antonyms and all kinds of nims, and um, in any case, he told me that his second grade teacher told him that um, he he should be he should be, he should have been taken or he told him and my daughter and her husband when they went in for a parent teachers conference right in front of little man that um, your son has ADHD and you should take him to a doctor and get him checked and get him on some medication. This was in second grade. Now, my, gr my youngest grandson is a doer. He's not, I mean, he is a thinker. He's, man, that child has some deep thoughts. He's, I think he's, you know, he's kind of an old soul kind of kid. But, um, and he takes everything. He doesn't really understand sarcasm. Um, he gets jokes and that kind of stuff, but sarcasm kind of gets lost on him. He, because he takes things very literally. He's a very literal t kind of child. But he's a doer. He's a little dooby dooby do. He's he's always got to be doing stuff. And so when he told me that his teacher had said that he needed to be, um, oh Kate, booyah! Kate just kicked another one. <laughs> <laughs> In any case, when he said his teacher told him that he had ADHD, I said, "You do know what that means, don't you?" And he said, "No, but I'm supposed." She said, "I should be taking pills for it." And I said, "No, you don't need pills for it." Do you know what that means? And he said, no. So I explained to him, it's attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And I said it just like that. And he looked at me and he said, well, what does that mean? And I said, well, attention deficit means that you're bored. You cannot pay attention. You're bored with whatever is being presented to you or it's not something that you find fascinating or whatever, but you just plain have a hard time paying attention to it because it just isn't grabbing your attention. So there's the attention deficit. Fancy words for a kid being bored because he's not, you know, he's not inspired to enjoy whatever. In any case, after that, I said, and then you have hyperactivity. Well, you know, when you're sitting here, like right now, and you're trying to do your phonics, and you're trying to figure out what's antonyms, and put them in a sentence, and all that other fun stuff, and you're twiddling your, your uh, pencil, and you're kicking your legs, and you're fidgeting around in your seat, that's hyperactivity what they call it. It means you've got lots and lots and lots of energy that you want to use because you're a kid and kids have lots of energy and you're bored with this. It's not grabbing your attention. It's not really thrilling you spitless to be doing this. So they say you have no attention span because you're bored and you're hyperactive. You're fidgeting because you're bored and you have to sit there in a chair with a bunch of other people who are also fidgeting in a chair because they're bored. So they want to put you on pills. And he said, yeah. And I said, do you know that the doctor that invented that thing when he was dying, he said that it was all made up because the pharmaceutical company had this drug that they really didn't have anywhere that they could use it for. And so, they decided to make something up and pawn it off on kids. Kitty crack. I didn't tell him it was kitty crack, but he said, you don't ever need to, ever, ever, ever need to take pills for that kind of stuff. You are a normal child, or as normal as can be. So, and don't worry about it. You're not ADHD. And when I talked to my daughter when she got home, because I'd said, you know, <clears throat> little man told me this. And she said, yeah, I was so livid with that teacher. And I complained to the principal. And I said, if she ever, ever, she was, my daughter was, oh, she, you could tell she was getting pissed just talking about it. 
But, yeah, she said, there's no way my son will be put on pills simply because something does not excite him. He's not passionate about it, and therefore he gets bored with it. But what he needs to understand is in order to get past this stuff, sometimes you need to do these things. You know, it's like those dirty jobs that nobody really wants to do, but, yeah, you got to do it. So, now, when I told him that I said dis order the way I said it for a reason he said why and I said because when you're hyperactive when you aren't paying attention when you're fidgety in class you are messing with the orderly flow of the classroom and the teacher's control and so when you have disorder do you know what the uh, prefix dis stands for? And he said he told me yes. And I said, well, you have order and then you have disorder. And when you are not fitting into that lovely little square peg, then the little order is now disorder. And so they slap it on you instead of figuring out, what the hell's wrong with their system that you've got so many children that supposedly have a disorder. Those children don't have a disorder. It's the system that's messed up. But, and then, you know, it wasn't too long. Well, when I finally got home, I checked my Facebook and went, holy carp and holy. And uh, I saw a chat going on. Some gal was saying how she was diagnosed with PTSD and diagnosed with this and diagnosed with that. And I said, sweetheart, you do realize that most of that shit is just made up because you cannot cope with the mess that they made of this world. There's nothing wrong with you. It is this society that's messed up. So whenever they start slapping a disorder on you, that's because you are one of those people that is not going to be in the orderly flow of things. So, you know, don't let them mess with you. And post-traumatic stress disorder, who doesn't have that in this society? Seriously. All the crap that's going on, you look at all of the people walking around day to day, down to the job, coming home, going to the job coming home. Look at all the people that, you know, out there going to work so that they can make money, so that they can have a house, so that they can buy things to put into that house, and now they have to go to work in order to pay for the things that they want to put in their house. Or buy the food. I can't tell you how many people I know out here that garden, garden big time, and they sell a lot of what they grow and then go buy food. Is that not messed up? That is messed up. That is messed up. And that is, that is why I think you're a rare, rare individual if you do not have some kind of post-traumatic stress disorder going on. Um, what are you guys talking about? contact page. One eye thing. What the hell? Okay, you guys. Now, where is where is this that you're looking at with the gal with the doing the one eye thing? Oh. Hmm. Okay. In any case, so, now that I've done that whole long spiel about what I think, about all that other fun stuff, and I have been listening to, uh, a lot of videos about wordplay and how the language is so deceptive and how we are told one meaning when actually there's another undercurrent meaning that, yeah. So, in my pocket, I threw this in there last week because I really was planning on doing a show last week Wednesday until, yeah, my computer decided to give me the black screen of death and took me two days to finally get it all figured out. Knock wood. <laughs> I mean, it would work, and then it wouldn't, and then it would work, and then it would wouldn't, and then it would do. Oh, well. In any case, I did 
wind up transferring a lot of shit to another computer just in case this one decides to give me the black screen of death again. Ah. Miners con Oh, well, thank you, Rob Works. I'll go I'll just go check this out. Oh. <coughs> Excuse me. She's kind of cute. Very skinny. Way too skinny. The girl needs to eat something. In any case, I saw this last week and I thought, wow. Was it last? Okay, maybe I saw it yesterday. No, I was thinking I saw it last week. I could be wrong. It says August 7th. Maybe it was. Shit, I don't know. I don't know much of anything other than what's going on right in front of me. And then even then I question that shit. Yeah, I do remember. Saw this yesterday. Okay, it was the other link that I will get to after this one. Having fun yet? Hmm. So, this is from free th the freethoughtproject.com. Former education secretary admits U.S. students are failing because education system runs on lies. And see, that's something that I've had running in the back of my mind for a long, 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 long time. If you start a foundation based, you may have one little kernel of truth. That's your cornerstone is that little kernel of truth. And then the rest of the foundation is a shitload of lies. And then you, you convince people that all of those lies in that foundation, well, this cornerstone is true, so therefore, the rest of those are true. That's the logic that gets used in this shit. You know you can build on a lie. You know you can. You've seen people do it in, in, in everyday interactions. Lies can be built upon, and then they can be built upon. And you can do whatever. I mean, cripes, it happens all the time in the scientific community. Global warming, climate change, global cooling, build on a lie, build on a lie. You'll convince some people, and if you pull the right strings, you'll bully enough to, um, to shut up and let you have your way. But in any case, <clears throat> so if you build on a lie, or a foundation of lies, you can further and continue that lie into infinity until someone comes along and pulls that cornerstone of truth out and then all of the lies collapse because when you pour, pull a cornerstone of truth out and you start using that to build on it just from where it takes you because that is truth oh well so it doesn't surprise me that it's a bunch of lies but in any case <clears throat> Typically, when Americans hear someone say that the education system in the United States runs on lies, they would expect the statement to come from a disgruntled parent or student. But now it's coming from the former Secretary of Education, as he admits that the U.S. lies to families on a daily basis by promising them a quality education through public schools. There's no such thing. You are being trained to be good little um, robots. Good little robots. If you noticed how the school schedule is starting to get more and more like the work schedule. In any case, Arnie Duncan, who served as the education secretary for the Dangleberry administration, now appears to be calling out all sides of the spectrum for failing to prioritize the next generation. Hmm, let's see what he's saying here. So in an interview with CBS Face the Nation, Duncan argued that politics are never held accountable or politicians are never held accountable for the failing students and teachers. And you know what? If you teach, th if you train the teachers with a bunch of bunkum and nonsense, hence that second grade teacher that your son has ADHD. Really? Because you can't entertain his mind, get him engaged in whatever you're doing, because of your inability, he has a problem. Okay, right, sure. So, <clears throat> we say that we value education, but we never vote on education. We never hold politicians accountable, local, state, or national level, for getting better results or higher graduation, graduation rates. More people graduate from college and Duncan goes on to say, we say we value teachers, but we don't pay teachers. We don't support them. We don't mentor them. 
not the way that they need to do. And yeah, what's incredibly important work, and it's very tough, complex work. Because yes, you have a classroom full of personalities, and each one has little idiosyncrasies that you have to figure out. A good teacher can do that, but they don't teach them to be good teachers anymore. And if you do have someone that makes it out of college that has that go-getting attitude, they don't stay in teaching for long because they realize that the more they put out, the more is going to be expected of them, and it's going to be expected of them for free. So as a nation, we're not top 10 in anything, Duncan said. And he has a solid point because the U.S. Department of Education released a troubling set of statistics in May, which showed that ma the majority of eighth graders in public schools are not proficient in reading or basic math. Are you kidding me? Those children should be able to read and do basic math by fourth grade fourth grade and in eighth grade and I, I gotta admit this even in my little local yokel I knew kids that graduated high school that could not read above a second grade level and could not do basic addition and subtraction that's sad those are things that you need to be able to do if for nothing else, to go forth and educate yourself on what you didn't get taught in school. Because getting taught in school teaches you recess time, and this time, and that time, and follow the herd, and do this, and don't make trouble. Don't be disorderly. Now, according to a report from the National Assessment of Educational Progress, or NAEP, only 34% of 8th grade students in American public schools were proficient in mathematics in 2017. 34%. That is way below a failing grade. Way below. And that number varied by state, with proficiency rates as high as 50% in Massachusetts and as low as 17% in Louisiana. 50, 50, 50 0% is still a failing grade. For those of you that went to school in my time frame, my era, 50% was a failing grade. Hell, 60 was a failing grade. The reading report from NAEP revealed that last year only 36% of 8th grade students in American public schools were proficient in reading. That number also varied by state with proficiency rates as high as 49% in Massachusetts and as low as 24% in New Mexico. Once again, all failing grades, every one of them. Now, Duncan also noted that the U.S. has raised a generation of young people and teens who've been raised on mass shootings and gun violence. Once again, PTSD. Yeah, traumatize you to the point where you just become a good little drone. Just keep your head down, looking at your little screen. Don't interact, don't make eye contact, and maybe you'll live another day. That's pretty much the bullshit that's going on right now. Lift your head and look around, peeps. So while he said that the U.S. is set apart from other countries because it does not value its teachers and its students through funding or care, he is one of the many government officials to claim the answer can be found in the new gun control legislation. Oh, goody, oh, joy, oh, bliss, here we go. However, Duncan did not address the fact that many of the suspects in school shootings struggled with depression and anxiety and were prescribed powerful, addictive, psychotropic drugs that came packed with a host of dangerous side effects, including aggression, violence, and suicidal tendencies. And then you have the whole peer pressure shit that goes on with kids, which is a learned behavior, by the way. They learn it from the rest of us. Children are sponges, and they learn by our example. So, 
<clears throat> Duncan also did not mention that a significant portion of the violence that is seen in public schools is perpetrated by the same individuals who are tasked with keeping students safe, the school resource officers who are stationed on campuses. So as the Free Thought Project has reported, there are a number of incidents in which officers were caught on video assaulting mentally ill and disabled students. And disabled, that's another one of those that they put the dis in front. Are you dissing these kids? What the hell? They are differently abled. You know, if you treat them like a cripple, they're going to eventually believe they're a cripple. But if you teach them that they have value and that they can do things and that the only limitations are the limitations they place on themselves, most of these children will excel. You just have to help them find what they're passionate about. To go on with this article, these officers also caught assaulting students for wearing the wrong uniform to school and assaulting students who pose no threat to them or anyone else. In a 2015 report from the Rutherford Institute, it further illustrated the point that American public schools are becoming increasingly similar to prisons. Huh, shock, shock. Noting that more than three million students are suspended or expelled from public school each year often for minor or ridiculous offenses, you know, like bringing a plastic knife to cut a hot dog or something, because it's a knife and we have zero tolerance. Oh my God, he ate his Pop-Tart, now it looks like a gun. We've got to suspend him for five days. Doesn't make any difference that he's a freaking first grader. Mm, uh, yeah, just look it up on the internet. There's all kind of shit out there. Um, there's a little insert here that says many state laws require that schools notify law enforcement whenever a student is found with an or imitation controlled substance, which basically is anything that looks like a drug but isn't actually illegal. And as a result, students have been suspended for bringing to school household spices such as oregano or breath mints or birth control birth control pills, or powdered sugar, egad and gadzooks. And it's not just look-alike drugs that can get a student in trouble under school zero-tolerance policies. Look-alike weapons like toy guns or even Lego-sized ones, hand-drawn pictures of guns, pencils twirled in a threatening manner, imaginary bows and arrows, even finger positioned like a gun, can also land a student in detention. Crazy? I think so. The world is crazy. Former Education Secretary Duncan is spot on when he says that the U.S. government's values don't reflect that we care about education or we care about teachers or that we truly care about keeping our children safe and free of fear. We have to stop teaching them fear in the first place. However, the truth is that in order to fix these problems, it's going to take a complete overhaul of the education and the prison it has become, up to and including dissolving it entirely. And that will never come from politicians who care about appeasing lobbyists more than the fragile minds and lives of the next generation. And they really don't care. If you ain't putting something in their pockets, they don't care. So, yeah. Yeah, Woody, we do need more education, <clears throat> but we don't need pu public education. Uh and all of this stuff of, you know, teaching them the feels. There are certain things that parents are supposed to be doing, and parents have a tendency to abdicate that responsibility to the schools. Why? Because so many parents are working two and three jobs because they've been caught up in this little rat race, treadmill bullshit of, 
you have to work and you have to have this kind of house and you have to have this kind of car and you have to do this and you have to do that. Work more, work more, work more, pay your taxes, buy things, put it on credit if you don't have the money now. And then that way you'll work the rest of your life paying off those credit card bills. And then with all of these people that are so overextended with their credit, they'll just go, well, so the country's got a big deficit. I got a big credit card bill too. See, one thing leads to another. Oh yeah, more expensive schools is better education. No, not necessarily, Meister Brad, but you just go right on ahead. I know what you're doing there, hun. <clears throat> Actually, what they need to do is the frickin' schools need to supply the regular. <laughs> that was one thing my daughter did tell me uh, out in Colorado, because I asked her about the schools, because they're, they're rebuilding schools. My grandkids don't start until after Labor Day. Of course, they don't get out until the second week of June, but, you know, they're refurbishing schools and all this other fun stuff. And I asked her, so is this the marijuana tax money that's paying for this? And she said, that's what she thought until she asked around and did some digging and found out that Colorado has not spent any of that money <clears throat> that it has gotten in from taxes garnered from marijuana sales because... They're keeping it in a slush fund because they have been told that since it is still illegal on a federal level, they cannot use that money for what they intended to use it for. So it's sitting in a slush fund. So basically, they're collecting all of this money and uh, not doing nothing with it. Nothing. Because they're afraid of the federal government. And I said, someone needs to teach them, people that the state has precedence over fed if you really want to look at it you go it's home rule starts out federal government has the least that's on the very bottom and it has the least amount of power then you go to the state level and that has just a little bit more than the federal government then you go to the county <clears throat> which has just a little bit more because it's more localized and it knows what the problems are in that local area. It has a little bit more power than or control or say in how things should be done. I don't however you wish to put that. And then you go to the city level. So it has a little bit more, but not a whole heck of a lot more. Home rule, the individual, has the most amount. The most amount. But that's not the way they, that's not, they've turned it topsy-turvy, which, once again, PTSD. No wonder people have stress disorders. They're being so disorderly. Shame on you, you disorderly people. Shame, 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 shame. Yeah, I know, Rob. It's just freaking crazy. It's illegal on the federal level, so we can't spend it. And banks don't want to take it. Banks don't want it coming because it's illegal on a federal level. And they don't want to, because if they take that money, then they say the feds can come in and seize all of their assets. It's a circle jerk going on. Basically, just a great big governmental foobar circle jerk. That's all there is to it. And in the meantime, they're all having a party and we get to pick up the tab. Don't you feel special? I know I do. I have a fun little tinfoil hat, too, to go along with it. And blue streaks in my hair, just because. Oh, and a few purple ones, too, because, you know, got to have those highlights and lowlights. So... Uh, let me put this over here on this effing site. Uh, da -da, da -da, da -da. Let me do, yeah, we'll do this guy, and then we'll do this guy. And then we'll go back to, where'd he go? We'll do that one. Yeah, our schools suck. And most of it, most of it, I attribute to the administrative part. They have entirely too many frickin' chiefs 
and all of the Indians are running around going, dude, you're getting fat off of this buffalo, and you got the nice fur, and we're sitting over here freezing our asses off and having to buy back from you just to be able to have a little gnaw on the bone. Kiss my ass. Hmm. Okay. So, back to my pocket I go. And to something that... Uh, relates to my grandson. You know, I would have never, and I've had grown people tell me, you know, I probably should be on Ritalin because I have PTSD. No, you don't. What the fuck? Excuse my, there's my F-bomb. Not quite an hour into the show, but seriously? Oh, well. This is from returntonow.net. Texas school beats ADHD by tripling recess time. There you go. Let them get out there and burn off some of that energy. Learn how to interact with each other in a friendly and playful manner. Instead of keeping them in little cubicles and trying to reenact brick in the wall. <clears throat> So while most school districts across the country are cutting back on recess time and ramping up on the Ritalin, one Texas school has kindergartners and first graders sitting still and incredibly attentive. So what's the secret? Their recess time has tripled. Instead of 20 minutes of recess per day, Eagle Mountain Elementary kindergartners and first graders now get an hour broken up into four 15-minute breaks in addition to lunchtime. And their teachers say it's a total transformation for them. The kids are less fidgety, less distracted, more engaged in learning, and make more eye contact. Oh my God, actually human-to-human -human interaction in a positive way. Heaven forbid. Eagle Mountain is one of a dozen or one of dozens of schools in Texas, Oklahoma, and California testing out extra recess time as part of a three-year trial. You really have to frickin' do that? Good God, I could have told you that, and I don't have an edumacraption. The pilot program is modeled after the Finnish school system, as in F-I-N-N-I-S-H, whose students get some of the best scores in the world in reading, math, and science. And the designer of the program, called Link, L-I-I-N-K, is a kinesiologist, Debbie Ray, of the Texas Christian University. Ray spent six weeks in Finland in 2012 to discover the secret of their success. And the biggest difference Ray noticed was that students in Finland get much more recess than American kids do. 15 minutes of unstructured outdoor play every 45 minutes of an or after every 45 minutes of instruction. See, you give them you give them all of this information then you let them go and do something physically active and you know the mind the mind will actually incorporate if it's given properly to the kids, it will incorporate it better if they have some physical activity going on. Now, the key is the unstructured, Ray told today, which means kids are allowed to run, play, and make up their own games. You know, can't, there are some schools doing away with recess altogether because somebody might get hurt. Kids need scraped knees and scraped elbows and bonks every once in a while. Helps boost the immune system and toughen them up a little bit. You need to have that activity going. So while indoor breaks are better than none, Ray says that they should ideally take place outdoors because fresh air, natural light, and vivid colors all have a big impact on brain function. Now the Link website says that benefits of frequent recess include increased attention focus, improved academics, improved attendance, decreased behavioral diagnoses such as anxiety, ADHD, or anger, improved creativity and social skill development, yeah, especially if you let them make up their own games like Calvin Ball or whatever the hell. 
because then they're making up the rules as they go along, kind of like grown-ups in government do. Okay, they aren't grown-ups, but, you know, chronologically, they're adult. Maybe they're adult. There's another one. Instead of a U, put an O in there. So some of the teachers at Eagle Mountain say that they were nervous about how they would keep the kids on track academically with all the lost classroom time. But halfway through the first year of the program, first grade teacher Kathy Wells told NPR that her kids were way ahead of schedule. Wells said that she spends a lot less time sharpening pencils these days. And you know why I was sharpening them? Because they were grinding on them. They were breaking them. They were chewing on them. They're not doing that now. They're usually or actually using their pencils for the way that they were designed to write things. And if you want a child to be attentive and stay on task, if you want them to encode the information you're giving them in their memory, you've got to give them regular breaks. That's from Ohio State University pediatrician Bob Murray. And Murray helped write the American Pediatrics Association's policy statement on recess. He says that brain scans have shown kids learn better after a break for physical activity and unstructured play. So, I could have told them that, but they didn't ask me. Oh, well. On track, Grimmy, and not the track and field thingy. Yeah, well, yeah, it depends on, you know, if they're funded by Big Pharma, then they want them on crack. But, oh, and yeah, Rob works. Basically, yeah, that's, they con they consider it money laundering what in Colorado if they actually use that marijuana tax revenue. Or they say that the federal government will consider it money laundering. And yeah. And so the banks are afraid to take it. It's it's freaking craziness. It is it is a circular logic thing. Where you just keep telling the bullshit to support the bullshit, to support the bullshit, to support the bullshit. It's just a circle jerk on steroids, basically. So... Okay, so the kids are playing, having fun, as they should. And, you know, I have noticed a lot of schools taking away, like, the jungle gyms and the high slipper slides and all this other fun stuff. How many of you guys played on the really big slipper slides? You know, and yeah, somebody got a broken bone, but that was just the coolest thing. You know, you come into school a day or two later and you had a cast and everybody got to sign your cast and your arm got stinky and itchy and you're sticking hangers down your cast. I never had a cast, but I had lots of friends that did. That's part of growing up. And, you know, it teaches kids that there are repercussions, and sometimes those repercussions include a cast. So, you know, be careful what you're doing, because now little Johnny and little Debbie, they have those lovely little, you must have your pads for your elbows and your knees, and you must have your helmet, because we don't want you getting hurt. First you stop them from getting physically hurt, then you try and protect them from getting emotionally hurt, and then next thing you know, Johnny and little Debbie needing to live inside a bubble. Although I have seen those giant bubble things, and they look fun. And I did get a set for my grandkids, and they had fun. Um, ooh. Ouch, Meister Brower. Ow, ow, ow. And yes, Rob works. All taxes, terror money. Yes. Damn. Now, see, I have fallen out of tree houses and fallen off of really high slipper slides. Of course, I had help. I had brothers. <laughs> but I never... Okay. I did, from what I understand, when I was little, I had a broken bone. But that was because a brother ran me over with a go-kart. I, I really don't remember it. I was kind of little. 
like really little, like three. But yeah, I don't remember that at all. But in any case, I mean, I, re I remember, you know, not getting to go outside, but I don't, yeah, whatever. In any case, um, yeah, kids need to, they need the rough and tumble. They need to find out that when you do something like that, there are repercussions, and sometimes those hurt. Sometimes they suck. Sometimes you get picked on about it, and that gives you a little bit thicker skin. And, you know, maybe people just need to stop and, and uh, stop, le stop letting children um, get away with being little douches all the time either. You know, control your assholio kids, because your assholio kids will grow up to be Captain Assholio adults. So, whoa. Okay, so, back to my pocket I go, because I did have a couple other things I wished to get to. Um, let's see. Nah, I don't think, I don't think I did this one yet. from Fox News. I know this is going to freak some people out, but I actually went to a Fox News, but it's like, whoa, that is just crazy. Um, no, I don't think I did, because it's from July 30th. So, this is Fox News, once again. Why is U.S. one of the most dangerous places in the developed Being world to give birth? Pain. Oh, Being stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. dumb thing. So, what is behind the U.S.'s low birth rate? So, hundreds of U.S. women die each year giving birth, and hospitals across the country aren't routinely following practices that would save women's lives during childbirth. That's according to a new USA Today investigation. There's a, of course, there is also an awful lot of unnecessary C-sections as well. <clears throat> so, every year about 50,000 U.S. women are severely injured and 700 die during childbirth. That's what the investigation found. And that makes the United States one of the most dangerous places in the developed world to give birth. Now, indeed, the U.S. has one of the highest maternity mortality rates among developed countries, with a rate of 26 deaths per 100,000 live births. And the U.S. is one of just five high-income countries to have a rate above 15 deaths per 100,000 live births. And according to a 2016 paper on maternal mortality published in the journal The Lancet, the other developed countries with high maternal mortality rates are Argentina, Brunei, Chile, and Uruguay. Yeah, that gives you a warm and fuzzy feeling, doesn't it? And while many other developed nations, including Germany, France, Japan, and England, have seen their maternal mortality rates fall over the last two decades, the United States actually saw an increase in maternal mortality over this time. So, why is the U.S. rate so high? Well, the US, USA Today investigation reviewed more than half a million pages of records from dozens of hospitals in New York, Pennsylvania, and North and South Carolina finding that hospitals often weren't following recommendations that could save women's lives. For example, fewer than half of maternity patients in these hospitals were promptly treated for dangerously high blood pressure that increases the risk of stroke. And many hospitals also failed to take steps to properly quantify women's blood loss which can indicate whether they're at risk of death from hemorrhage. Now, experts say that about 50% of the deaths of women from child-related causes could be prevented if they were given better medical care. But, you know, it is a medical system. So, yeah. 
if you're going to be causing disorder in the system, ooh. okay, so um, Allison Young, who is the author of the investigation, told CBS this morning um, that, um, and that's a really surprising thing given that we're one of the wealthiest countries in the world and we spend so much on medical care. Yeah, but most of that medical care goes to big pharma. Young said more hospitals need to follow evidence-based practices to reduce maternal mortality. California is an example of how attention to the problem can lead to results. After researchers in the state began promoting toolkits to reduce death and injuries during childbirth, the state's maternal mo mortality rate fell by half from 2009 to 2015. And USA Today, or that's in the USA Today report. Now these toolkits consist of policies, procedures, and checklists that appear to help save mothers' lives. Now California has a maternal mortality rate of just four deaths per 100,000 live births. That's the lowest in the nation among the 47 states with recent data available, according to the investigation. So, they're one of the early adopters where an organization out there has really pushed hospitals to follow these evidence-based best practices. So, apparently the original article was on live science, but I had a Fox News link, so there you go. But, bungholio? Okay. Holy crap, Meisterbrow. You had a rough childhood, didn't you? So... I had a Siamese cat jump on my head when I was two years old. Scratch shit out of me. I still got scars. But, yeah. My hair hides most of it. And, yeah, my dad took care of that cat. <laughs> and that's probably why I still don't like Siamese cats. But, oh well. So, let me put this over here on this effin site as well. Real quick. Ooh, Bubba be barking. Okay. Which one do I want to use? I want the nurse here because, yeah, she scares hell out of me. Okay. Now, back to my pocket I go. There was something else, and maybe I didn't. Hmm. Hmm. There was something else, and apparently I did not put it in my pocket. And I should have. Damn it. But I didn't. So. Oh. Here we go. I think, I don't think I've done this one. Don't think I have. From the AmericanConservative.com. Yeah, they had a little pop-up with the Trumples. I'm, I'm using my, um, uh, let me see. God dang it. God dang it. Yeah, Vivaldi, which I think Vivaldi is, is a uh, Google-based browser, but I like it. And it doesn't take up as much room as Opera did. doesn't have as many, I don't think. It's not as slow as Opera was getting. All them frickin' updates on Opera. It's like, damn, this thing is slow. So, Opera, you totally screwed up because I really, really liked your setup and all that other fun shit. But, man, all your damn updates and yada, yada, blah, blah, bullshit that you keep adding to it. Made it to where I didn't want to use your browser anymore. Sorry. Okay, so from the AmericanConservative.com, parents as enemy. Dun dun dun. Which yes, they want they want to circumvent. You know, make it to where the kids 
don't, you know, and parents that don't interact with their children, which that happens an awful lot. There's an awful lot of parents that, well, let's face it, everybody's working, sometimes two jobs, and so they're freaking exhausted when they get home. And they eat crap, you know, whether it's prepackaged shit at the grocery store or fast food shit, they're eating crap. And so they just don't interact with their kids and they leave it to the school system and they leave it to the, the doctors and they leave it to this and they leave it to that. And next thing you know, when they want to interact with their child, everything else says, sorry, sorry, you have pretty much abdicated that responsibility and that's not your child anymore. We can do what we want. Hell, your child can get an abortion at 14 and they don't have to tell you. Some states have that shit, and that's bullshit. But a Philadelphia public schools just put their principals through a boot camp that featured indoctrination into gender theory. Yay. And on account of safety, of course. Now, safety is a universal solvent of tra uh, traditional gender and sexual norms in public schools. You know, we must, it's for the children, for their safety, for their own good. Yeah. So, here's what school personnel in Philly are trained to do if they find a student who calls himself or herself transgender. Explicit in the district's policy is the belief that any student's feelings about their gender identity are the most important consideration. If a student comes to a principal saying that they wish to identify as transgender, it's incumbent to the principal or on you to be sensitive. This is what Overton told the new principals. And then they read and discussed the policy and role-played situations that might crop up inside their schools. I would say, does your parent know? If not, would you like me to be there to help you tell them? See, that is undermining. <laughs> so, or do you want them to not know? We'll keep this a secret between you and I. Oh, that's great. How's that going to work out? Pizzagate, anyone? Normalization of pedophilia, anyone? It starts with, we'll keep this secret. I'll help you keep your secret from your parents. <sighs> In one case, a student fearful for their safety if a parent found out that they identified as transgender, transgender is known by one name at school, but is called by their legal name around their parent and in correspondence from the school. That is bullshit. We're going to respect the child's right to safety, Overton said, and make sure that's really clear to your staff. You know, maybe you should have a little chitty chat. Oh, man, this goes way, oh. It, it's off the deep end here, peeps. Off the charts, stupid. And this is because brainwashing over the years. Wash your brain of all the nonsense. And every day, wash, rinse, repeat. So... The public schools in Philadelphia are committed to formally lying to parents of students for the sake of advancing this cause because of safety, don't you know? Emily Zenos is a Minnesota parent who saw her children's school, Nova Academy, destroyed by two zealous parents of a trans child. In 2017, she wrote about why parents have to get involved in activism to save their kids' school before it's too late. And an excerpt from that is, Gender activism moves fast, is well-funded, and directs a significant amount of resources at public schools. The tragic consequences of this ideology are all around us. Teen girls getting mastectomies, Minors put at risk of being sterilized by synthetic hormones and a gag on scientific inquiry. 
but who will dare say the emperor has no clothes? With public schools fast becoming incubators of gender ideology, parents need to cast off their fears of entering the fray, speak out, and most importantly, teach your children that their sex is a beautiful biological reality. If it is not already in your children's school, it will be. So are you ready for it? As far as these activists and their fellow travelers in the educational bureaucracy are concerned, you, mom and dad, are the enemy. And that's how they do it. That is how it's done. Oh... Woody, once again, it's one of those things of, you know, it got me in the feels. And, you know, I saw something on um, Instagram earlier today that just made me giggle. And Ant is the one that posted it. Um, used to be the big kahuna on WT. And it was um, in Texas, a five-year-old girl walked into a restroom to use the bathroom. And she was closely followed by a 40-something-year-old man who identified as a woman. Now, that man, it was later found, had lost all of his teeth because the father followed his daughter into the bathroom and said that he knocked out all of his teeth because he identified as the tooth fairy. I like that. I thought that was funnier than hell. And you know what? If y'all are going to be doing this, I identify as, I can identify as whatever the hell I want. And people are just so messed up when it comes to this whole feelings shit. You know, when you say, I am sad, or I am happy, or I am angry, you are letting that emotion own you. But when you say, I feel sad, I feel angry, I feel frustrated, you are acknowledging that you have a feeling that's going on and yet you can control it. But when you say, I am, you are telling your subconscious that you are. That is how you are going to identify as angry, as sad, as hurt, as frustrated as whatever but if you feel those emotions then you acknowledge their existence and yet you still have control over them and sadly sadly there are many in this world or at least in this country that no longer have control of their emotions they just am too much of this I am you want to feel something, feel it and control it. Learn from it. But once you let it own you, I am, you're lost. Okay, time for something fun. Time for something silly. How about it's time for the pig? Which, by the way, Hambo's lovely bride sent me a birthday wish as well and a big long thing of all the different things that happened that date in history and it's like, that is so cool. Thank you, hon. But I have no idea where it's at now. <laughs> it's somewhere on my Facebook wall. So, from the pig. Uh, let's see. You have to be patient with me. I'm just a guitar player. I didn't go to college. I was too busy learning stuff. That's the quote from Ted Nugent. And nah, Nuge is okay. There's times that he really pisses me off. And then there's times where it's like, okay, Nuge, you go ahead. You would be a hell of a lot more entertaining than a lot of these douchebags that are out there. So, let me see what this... Okay. Mm. So, the word of the day yes. Oh, see you later, Dan. Darn it, there he went.
Bye, Dan. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you for listening in. Okay, the word of the day is history. It is a noun. And it's a cumulative account of the ways in which a bunch of dead people have screwed up in exactly the same ways that we are screwing up right now. That's from the Dictionary of Sarcasm. I do like that. I do like that definition. In the quotable quotes section, freedom is the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. That is from George Orwell. Oh, and they have a new thing over here, zinger of the day. Woohoo! So, the alpha male challenge. One, take a picture of your girlfriend. Two, find a nice frame. Three, hang it in the kitchen. Four, write employee of the month under the picture. And five, either run far and run fast or be prepared to kiss your nads goodbye. Really? Hmm. Hmm. I think that would be funny. I'd let it hang on the wall. What the hell? Okay. Um... In their tasty tidbits, they have Dr. Hurd's hit piece on media meatheads. So, is the media really the enemy of Americans? Mm hmm. So, is the American news media an enemy of the American people, or has POTUS Trump overstated it? Well, the answer is yes, unequivocally. The dominant established American news media is an enemy of the people, even if they do not know it or care to know it. And here's why. Liberty, freedom, and individual rights are objectively valuable. The media supports the opposite of these things. Its hostility runs deeper than President Trump. The media detests capitalism even though they're part of the for-profit structure and their sur means of survival. The media got its way and capitalism, or if the media got its way and capitalism were abolished, before too long we'd have a government-run media, which we already have, it's just the shadow government, and as in all socialist and authoritarian countries. Already got it. They would no longer work for profit, and they'd no longer work with the freedom to say what they wish to say, even when it's false. There's already a lot of them that can't say that, so, yeah. And they get fired, or are consided. Um, let's see, where does it go? Uh, they would be legally bound not to offend the government. Careful what you wish for, left-wing journalists, yeah. First, they came for... Mm-hmm. I've been sharing that video around quite a bit lately. So, the media hates our Bill of Rights. It overwhelming, overwhelmingly and consistently runs biased stories in favor of political correctness, against gun ownership by peaceful citizens, against the Second Amendment itself. The First and Second Amendment are the two most precious liberties in our Bill of Rights. That's precisely why the media hates them, and it's precisely why media professionals are not your friend, but your enemy. People have free will. They do not have to listen to the media's crap. Increasingly, they're tuning it out, as low ratings on CNN demonstrate. But it doesn't change the fact that the media is our enemy. And if liberty, freedom, and the First and Second Amendments and the rest of our republic matter, and if our lives are better off with those things than without them, then anyone who attacks them with the ferocity and consistency of our dominant media establishment is most indeed our enemy. You've heard the phrase, friends don't let friends drive drunk. Well, the media should be our friend. It should be on the side of free speech, individual rights, gun rights, private property rights, and all the things without which the media itself would not last five minutes. Friends don't tell friends that freedom and liberty don't matter. Yet the media tells us that implicitly and explicitly.
each and every minute of every hour of every day. So long live freedom of speech and the First Amendment. But our dominant media establishment can rot if truth and liberty are what you value the most. So... Hmm. Okay. Do I want to go there? Yeah. I got another one here. God and Harley Davidson. Hmm. So, the inventors of the Harley Davidson motorcycle, William Harley and Arthur Davidson, died and went to heaven. At the gate, St. Peter told them, Since you've been good men and your motorcycles have change the world, your reward is you can hang out with anyone you want to in heaven. Well, they thought about it for a minute, and then they said, we want to hang out with God. So, Grimmy, they're going to hang out with you. So, St. Peter took them to the throne room and introduced them to God, and God recognized them and commented, okay, so you were the ones who invented the Harley-Davidson motorcycle. Yeah, that's us. And then God said, well, what's the big deal in inventing something that's pretty unstable, is very noisy, and pollutes the air, is completely unreliable, and can't run without a road? And Harleys do have a tendency to mark their territory. Well, Arthur was apparently embarrassed, but finally spoke, well, excuse me, but aren't you the inventor of women? And God said, ah, yes. Well, said Arthur, professional to professional, you have some major design flaws in your invention. Number one, there is way too much inconsistency in the front ends. Number two, it chatters and whines constantly at all speeds. Number three, most rear ends are too soft and wobble too much. Number four, the intake is placed way too close to the exhaust. And number five, the maintenance costs are outrageous. Hmm, you have some good points there, replied God. But hold on. God went to his celestial supercomputer and typed in a few words and waited for the results. And the computer printed out a slip of paper and God read it. It may be true that my invention is flawed, God said to Arthur, smiling. But according to these statistics, far more men are writing my invention than yours. <laughs> I like that. I like that. That's cute. Okay, this date in history, the 8th of August, 1609. The world's first peep show occurs when a Venetian Senate examines Galileo Galilei's telescope. Cool. This date in history, the 8th of August, 1844, Brigham Young chosen as head honcho of Mormon Church following the death of Joseph Smith, begins ordering followers to begin knocking on doors and making pests of themselves. Mm -hmm. This date in history, the 8th of August, 1854, Smith and Wesson patents metal bullet cartridges. Cha-ching, and that's why we can't have nice things. This date in history, the 8th of August, 1898, Will Kellogg invents cornflakes. Thanks, dude. Nasty shit. But it does work pretty well for, you know, making like a crumble for your fried chicken. Crush it up real good. This date in history, the 8th of August, 1918, six U.S. soldiers surrounded by Germans in France. Sergeant Alvin York, given command, shoot 20 Germans, or um, given the command, shoots 20 Germans and captures 132 more. Whoa. Dude. This date in history, the 8th of August, 1976, Chicago White Sox owner and master showman Bill Veek has his team suit up and play in short pants. Huh. And finally, this date in history, the 8th of August, 1990, Pete Rose, Charlie hustled himself into Federal Gray Bar, begins 5 MS. Hmm. 
5 MS term, okay, at the Marion, Illinois prison camp. What is MS? 5 millisecond? Hmm. Okay. I could give two shits less about Pete Rose, but what the hell. So, there's lots and lots more over here on the pig. PIGazette.com. Come on over and tell them Grammy sent you and watch them run. It's funny. So, let's see. Now that I've done that, I do have another one in my pocket that that reminded me of. You know, with the media being the enemy and all that fun stuff. Where is that at? Where, where, oh, where are you doing that? There it is. Not in my pocket. This is from TheIntercept.com. Even the FBI agrees. When undercover agents pose as journalists, it hurts real journalists' work. Yeah, they've been doing that for a while, them and the CIA. So the FBI doesn't want the public to know more about how its agents pose as journalists during undercover investigations. Yes. Oh, months? Okay, thanks, Graham. I couldn't figure out what the hell MS was. No straws? No straws! Oh, my God. What, they don't want people sucking more than they already do? Okay. Whatever. Back to this. So, in a federal court case, Justice Department lawyers confirmed the most significant criticism of the controversial practice. The government acknowledged in a court filing that FBI agents who pretend to be journalists create a chilling effect, making it harder for real journalists to gain trust and cooperation from sources. Oh, and I thought they were just getting really good at sharing the propaganda. So the astonishing admission came as the FBI attempted to fend off litigation from Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, which was filed, or which has filed requests for documents under the Freedom of Information Act. Now the Reporters Committee litigation involves documents related to an FBI undercover operation in which agents posed as documentary filmmakers for a fake company called Longbow Productions to investigate Nevada rancher Cliven Bundy and his supporters. In response to the Reporters Committee's records request, the FBI issued a Glomar response and uh, in which the agency neither confirms nor denies that it possesses records relevant to the FOIA request. Uh -huh. Now, in the motion filed July 23rd, Assistant U.S. Attorney John H. Walker argued that providing FBI documents about the Bundy investigation and others in which a journalistic cover may have been used would not only disclose sensitive investigative techniques, but also, in recognition of the chilling effect, would allow criminals to judge whether they should completely avoid any contact with documentary film crews, rendering the investigative technique ineffective. Yada, 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 blada, blada, blada. So, the FBI has previously disclosed that agents have pretended to be news reporters to further investigations. But questions remain about how often such covers are used and what policies are in place to govern the, de govern the deployment of fake reporters. Fake reporters bringing fake news. Now it all makes sense. So, by admitting that FBI impersonation of documentary filmmakers makes individuals less likely to speak to documentary filmmakers, the government is highlighting the very reason that the Reporters Committee filed the Freedom of Information Act case. The chilling effect this uh, government practice has on journalism, said Katie Townsend, and the reporter Reporters Committee's legal director is that the public already knows that the FBI engages in this practice. The FBI's widely reported Longbow Productions front is a prime example. 
the public is entitled to understand how frequently and under what circumstances the FBI does it. See now, if the public actually got that information, there would be lynch mobs. There would be tar and feather and, yeah, it would not be pretty. FBI is doing a CYA. So the concerns about the FBI practice gained momentum in 2014 when bureau officials reported that agents had pretended to be an Associated Press journalist seven years earlier. In June of 2007, a 15-year-old high school student near Seattle email, emailed bomb threats to his school, causing daily evacuations of the building. Now, FBI agents investigating the threats were unable to track the student due to his use of proxy servers. Hiding behind their cover as an AP journalist, agents emailed the student links to a fake news article and photographs that surreptitiously installed a tracking program. In response to the revelation, the Reporters Committee and the AP, working with 25 other news organizations, sent letters to then FBI Director James Comey and then Attorney General Eric Holder objecting to the FBI's use of journalistic covers. In response, Comey provided a letter to the New York Times that defended the practice. That technique was proper and appropriate under Justice Department and FBI guidelines at the time, Comey wrote. And today, the use of such an unusual technique would probably require higher level approvals than in 2007, but it would still be lawful and, in rare case, appropriate. Mm -hmm. It would still be lawful. Uh, get that L out of there and have it just be awful. How's that sound? Now, the Justice Department's Office of the Inspector General which investigated this practice, reported in September of 2016 that the FBI had instituted an interim policy that required agents posing as a member of the news media to obtain approval from the Bureau's deputy director in consultation with the deputy attorney general. And the FBI has declined to comment on whether this policy is still in effect. Now, immediate public safety concerns, such as those presented in the case of bomb threats near Seattle, do not appear to be a key factor for the FBI to justify using a journalistic cover. After obtaining more than 100 hours of video and audio recordings produced by Longbow Productions and the company's supposed director, an FBI agent who went by the name of Charles Johnson, the Intercept told the behind-the-scenes story of how the FBI interviewed Bundy and his supporters as part of a supposed documentary film titled America Reloaded. In that case, FBI agents were not investigating an immediate public safety concern or even an active crime. Instead, they were investigating Bundy's armed standoff with federal agents which had occurred nearly a year earlier. The Interceptor also reported that local police in Colorado had arrested the FBI agent Johnson, Johnson, what an appropriate name, in 2016 while he pretended to be working with a journalist. Johnson appeared to be investigating a development proposal for a nightlife and entertainment district near Denver. No immediate public safety concern appeared to be involved in that case either. So in person is, in, impersonation of journalists and filmmakers is not, in our view, an appropriate law enforcement tactic, said Townsend of the Reporters Committee. And when FBI agents masquerade as journalists, it threatens the independence and credibility of actual journalists and it can also jeopardize their safety. If a source believes that a journalist is actually a government agent, they may be unwilling to speak to that journalist at all. And in some cases, a journalist or filmmaker might be in danger if a source believes that she or he is a law enforcement agent pretending to be a journalist. 
All kinds of ugly scenarios pop into my mind. Now, the Reporters Committee's uh, uh, litigation with the FBI is ongoing, and the Press Freedom Group has until August 29th to respond to the Bureau's argument that releasing the documents would improperly disclose sensitive law enforcement techniques. Oh, like creating fake news and asking leading questions and doing creative editing and yeah that kind of stuff yeah I get it so ah thank you Grimmy or not Grimmy, Vinny. Vinny's the one that did that. And yes, the FBI is crooked as hell. <laughs> you guys are being naughty in here. Naughty, 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 naughty. And that's why I love you, because you're so silly. So, we'll just put this. And we'll do that one. Yeah, because the FBI, they get the single finger salute. I liked it much better long, long ago when it was considered FBI counted as um, female body inspector. <laughs> I knew some people that had t-shirts that said that. Okay, so let's see. What else do I have? I have just a few minutes left. What's going on over here? On Oops, I closed Twitter. Oops. Oops. Oh well. Uh, dun, 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 dun. So why is that the most dangerous to appearances? Okay. Don't give me that shit. There was something I saw over on Mines about um the 50 largest U.S. companies and how they are connected. And this is from ZeroHedge.com. And it's visualizing how the 50 largest U.S. companies are connected. And they have a lovely little interconnectedness of companies through shared board members thing. Um, it's not really a diagram. It's not really a graph. It's just a wonderful little image that pretty much lets you know that um, for any corporation, the board of directors plays a crucial role in corporate guidance. Uh-huh. Elected by the company's shareholders, the board is meant to represent shareholder interests, and it ultimately hires the CEO, sets strategic objectives, approves annual budgets, and provides accountability to the shareholders regarding the performance of the organization. Now, these duties are no cakewalk, and as visual capitalist Jeff, yeah, I'm not even going to butcher that last name notes, finding uh, capable and experienced board members to help run a multi-million dollar corporation just ain't easy. So there's an awful lot of corporate overlap. Shock, shock. And to locate a qualified candidate, one option is to hire someone that already has experience working on a big corporate board, which is probably how we get directors of the FDA and CDC and, yeah. And because of it, it's, since it's a part-time gig, people can actually be on multiple boards at once. So, there apparently was a Reddit user... QWERTY2020, who did a visualization chart thingy, and it shows the overlap between boards of the top 50 largest companies in the United States. And I'm going to go ahead and share this over here in the RLM chat, so y'all can check this shit out, because it's like, yeah, that does not surprise me one damn bit. Skagit? Hmm. Yay, Kate! Kicking another bot. Booyah! Hmm. Okay. 
back to my pocket I go because I think I may have okay dun dun I thought I might have something in here but oh and I did see and I don't remember where I even saw this it's from the fifth column news dot com information disorder the essential glossary and um, it has an awful lot of lovely terminology to uh, help you figure out how they do this shit so trying to follow the national conversation about faker faker belly acre news or spewage mostly that comes out of the corporate lame ass propaganda system thank you Grim I actually love that one and the spread of bad information online, it can be confusing because not everybody is using the same vocabulary. And if they are using the same vocabulary, they're definitely not using the same definitions for those words. So Claire Wa um, Wardle, who is a research fellow at Harvard's Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy, has created a glossary to help everyone understand certain words and phrases and how terms that may seem quite similar actually have very different meanings. For example, disinformation is false information meant to cause harm, while misinformation is false information that might cause harm, although not deliberately. Mincing words? Well, she's from Harvard. So, let's see definitions and terminology matter and for the policy makers technology companies politicians journalists librarians educators academics and civil society organizations are all wrestling with the challenges posed by information disorder agreeing to share vocabulary is essential now this glossary, and I'm going to share this over in the chat and over on Effin and probably put it over here on Minds as well, but the glossary features the most frequently used and commonly misunderstood words, acronyms, and phrases that relate to information disorder. Remember, put that hyphen in there. Disorder. It's designed to be a living document that will evolve as a reference point alongside research findings, shifts in technology, and the inevitable debates sparked by the definitions. So, I'm going to kind of just scroll down and uh, see, pick out a few words. How about artificial intelligence? That's pretty much anybody in Congress anymore. They think they've got intelligence, but it's all fake. So it describes computer programs that are trained to solve problems that would normally be difficult for a computer to solve. Now these programs learn from data parsed through them, adapting methods and responses in a way that will maximize accuracy. So as disinformation grows in its scope and sophistication, some look to AI as a way to effectively detect the moderate concerning content. And AI also contributes to the problem, automating the process that enable and the creation of the more persuasive manipulations of visual imagery and enabling disinformation campaigns that can be targeted and personalized much more effectively, i.e. creative editing. Yeah, you can say, oh, well, it was the bot that did it. Bots, I gotta find out what bots are because Kate's kicking the shit out of the bots over there in the RLM chat. Bots are social media accounts that are operated entirely by computer programs and are designed to generate posts and or engage with content on a particular platform. In disinformation campaigns, bots can be used to draw attention to misleading narratives, to hijack platforms, uh, their trending lists, and to create the illusion of public discussion and support. 
Researchers and technologists take different approaches to identifying bots, using algorithms or simpler rules based on numbers of posts per day. So, there was another one as I scrolled when I first looked at this. Fact checking. Something <laughs> that Snopes does not do. Fact checking in the context of information disorder is the process of determining the truthfulness and accuracy of official published information such as politicians' statements and news reports. Fact checking emerged in the U.S. in the 1990s as a way of authenticating claims made in political ads airing on television. There are now around 150 fact checking organizations in the world and many now also dis debunk myths and disinformation from unofficial sources circulating online. Hmm. Ah, this is the one that I wanted to get to. Propaganda. Propaganda is true or false information spread to persuade an audience, but often has a political connotation and is often connected to information produced by governments. It is worth noting that the lines between advertising, publicity, and propaganda are often unclear. Yeah. So, little brain food that I'm going to leave you with that you can finish reading at your leisure. Y'all been listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair here on this Wacka 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 Doodle Wednesday. Thank you all for tuning in. I will be back on Friday for the Freaker Friday edition of the Rocket Chair. But until then, y'all have an absolutely amazing rest of your evening. I hope Thursday is just totally splendiferous. Once again, my plan is to play in the yard, so I will probably be a sore puppy by the end of the day. <laughs> but what the hell. In any case... Remember, please, I really do love you all. Don't agree with the y'all. Don't like what y'all do sometimes. But I do wish you all enough. Good night.